How many of you maybe could have gone to college and played? Maybe. Okay, according to you, right? <laughs> All right. That's good. However, if you have not, did not play in high school, that doesn't mean you can't be a very good official. I, in fact, I heard uh, something on the way up here that David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA, never played a game in his life. But he knows a whole lot about the game. So my point is, whatever background you are, you can get to wherever you want to be with whatever sport that you're, you're in, and there's still a chance. And just because you haven't played that particular sport, it really doesn't matter, especially in today's uh, day and age. A uh, couple things of, in my opinion, why officiating and doing what you're doing is such a good thing. One, although when they're yelling and screaming at you out on the floor, sports needs officials. It's nice to be needed. I've always felt that. Even though they're yelling and screaming at us, it's nice to be needed. I've always kind of been, been in a background in, in my career, uh, and it's just nice to be like the, I was at the Super Bowl two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when the lights went out, the electrician was really needed at that time. I've always liked to be in those positions where I could really help out, and I think officiating is, is one way to do that. Uh, two, in your life, it gives you tremendous balance. If you stick with this, like I have done, if you stick with this, and it can be basketball or whatever else, I think it's very important to have balance in life. In my life, I have my family, I have my job, I have officiating, and in the summertime, I knock the white ball around the golf course a lot. Those are my four different things, and I, I th it's incredible how, how intertwined they can be and how important one is to the other. So officiating, and especially if you get good at it, and I never have said I was any good, that's just, I let, leave that up to other people, can, it's not a job, it becomes an outlet. It becomes something you really want to do. And when you pack your bag in the morning and you put it in the trunk, you I get to go officiate tonight, no matter where it is. And that's where, what you're trying to do. I get to officiate at Butler Intramurals, or I get to officiate at Carmel High School, or a girls game, or whatever it is. You want to, be able, you want to do that. Uh, because it just gives you incredible balance. You know, I walked out of here and you know, we'll look at this as part of officiating. I had a really bad day at work. I was going to say another word, but he's got me on tape. Uh, I had a bad day at work. It was a very hard day. But I knew at 2.15 when I walked out of that office, I was going to be able to come up here and throw it out the door, throw everything out the door behind me, and get an opportunity to spend some time with you guys. And then when I'm done from here, if this is a really crappy time, which I doubt it will be, I, I get to go to Richmond and referee tonight. So it, it gives you balance in your life, and I just think that's in, incredibly important. I also think that the, whatever crap that you take officiating or whatever life lessons you learn help you in your career. As I was telling some people a few minutes ago, I was a student manager at IU for Coach Knight back in the mid-80s, and that's when IU basketball was, it's at a fever pitch now. They're still not back to where they were in those days. I mean, it was a statewide thing, and that machine was fed everything it needed to succeed. Um, and, and I got to referee scrimmages for Coach Knight. Now, he used to just absolutely not physically, but mentally, just beat the snot out of us referees. It was, it was just awful. I was 18 years old, very first day of practice, true story. 18 years old, that's the first time in my life I'd ever seen Coach Knight in a, in a room this big. You know, you see him on TV and you've been to some games. And towards the end of practice, Knight yells, managers get the whistles. I have no idea what that means. but. A senior manager who had been refereeing for three years goes over, knew I refereed, gets the whistle off the ball cart, throws it to me and says, you're on. And I went out and refereed a scrimmage that day. The last game I'd worked with was a fifth grade girls game the previous March. And I'm out there with Isaiah Thomas and Ray Tolbert and, and a bunch of guys that we went, end up winning the national championship that year. And I still say that year of officiating those scrimmages helped make me if I'm anything at all in life, help make me what I am today because it was that hard. He just beat the snot out of us mentally and was yelling and screaming, and what are we going to do, tech him? <laughs> You're out of the gym, it's your gym, what am I going to do? 
he threw us out of practice. He made us watch tape of our scrimmages because they videotaped every minute of every practice. Make you watch tape. And at the end of the day, what he was trying to do was what? Make us better. Now, I didn't know when I was 18, you know, when I've got nothing left in my rear end from him after a day of practice, I had no idea. But he was trying to make us better. And fast forward that to my officiating career. I've worked the high school state championship. I've worked the NCAA Division III national championship. I've worked the NAIA, some good level of championship. I don't know how many Division III postseason games. I've worked in, in and out of seven Division I uh, leagues. And it, it just, I still think those, th that time helped me to get to where I am today. Because at the same time, I was doing exactly what you guys were doing. I'd get done with practice, and because I had no money, trying to put myself through school, I would leave practice, referee in, and what I do, I go referee. And those intramural games at IU, I remember vividly Sigma Nu A against the Fiji A, because they'd have their big fraternities and have big teams, and, and, and you know, they're six deep all the way around the little court, and they're calling you everything, but you know, Mike, uh, it, those were some formative years, uh, and, and it's exactly what you guys are doing now. And I, it will, it's going to make you a better person, no question about it, what you're doing. And if, it's you, if you work, I personally think that refereeing basketball is the hardest sport there is to referee. Because in football, they have a flag. And they carry it in here. So, let's see, there's holding. Now well, I'm not real sure. Oh, yeah, that was holding. And then we run down the, 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 the uh, field. And we all get together and go, do you guys think that was holding? I didn't think it was holding. Do you think it was holding? Well, okay, you know what? It's not holding anymore. There was no foul on the play. In basketball, you've got about that long to decide what to do. And there's no getting together. You're on your own. And I, again, I just think it helps you in life, helps you be a better person. So I don't know how many, how many of you are here today because you have to be, you're here today because you want to be, or officiating because you have to for money or want to or whatever. Uh, but just think that for all the crap you're probably taking now, that at the end of the day, there is something out there that's, worth, that's worthwhile. Um, with that said, if you aspire to go higher, and there's a lot of guys out there doing it now, pay your dues. Somebody walks in today and said, I need a, somebody, a referee, a varsity game at whatever the closest, North Central High School tonight. Uh, our guy got sick. Do I have any volunteers? None of y'all should go. Because no, you're going to get out there and you're going to get, you're, you're not ready. And I'm assuming you aren't ready. Some of you may re be refereeing high school ball already. I don't know. You're not ready. Because those are big games with athletes and kind of athletes that you're not used to. So don't put yourself in that situation. Take your time. Pay your dues. Let me ask you this. How many of you would like to work high school ball or college or, or are interested in doing this down the road, at least as we sit here today? A few of you. Okay. And that's great. The rest of you, that's fine too. You may change your mind. You may not. That's, it, it's up to you. It's not for everybody. If you can handle yourself out in front of two, three, four, five thousand people and, and can handle everybody yelling and screaming at you and you know you're right and you know they're, all those idiots are wrong, then you're in the right spot. But if you can't, then maybe it's not the right thing. So um, I'm going to talk about some game management stuff and some of it may be pertinent to you guys and some of it may not. Uh, does anybody have any questions to, to this point? This kind of history and what have you? Okay, no. All right. Um, from a game management standpoint, I think this is the most important aspect in, in basketball is handling the game. You guys are getting ready to start your intramural tournament, right? Is that correct? Is that I understand it? Okay. Handling these games in game management can be more important than calls. For example, when you go to the game, do you guys check the ball, take air out of the ball, put air in the ball, anything like that? No, probably not at that level. Okay. Well, let me tell you why a little detail like that is important. 
and I know you, you know you're running these games this fast and there's five minutes in between but let me give you an example if you get a ball that has too much air in it and you drop it from here and it goes to the ceiling that you, you're you're in for a rotten game and here's why none of the big kids that are supposed to get the rebounds get the rebounds the ball hits and bing, it goes out here and all the little guys are getting the rebounds and they're just scrambling after everything that's a game management deal you want the big guys to get the rebounds because that's what they're out there for if not everybody's diving all over the floor trying to pick up this ball and suddenly the guards are coming out with it and it completely changes the game so first thing I do when I'm a referee on the game I carry a uh, needle in my pocket of my jacket and I get that ball and if, if I drop it from six feet and it goes even even to here psst, we're taking some air out of it because I want to make sure the big guys get the rebounds okay little stuff if you're trying to get somewhere these will these will make sense down the line um, develop your own personality out there you don't have to be like all those guys on TV they're just you know doing this all the time have some fun show some personality even with these games that you're working here if you smile a little bit some guy gets dumped on the floor help him up pat him on the ass and let's go nice play especially in jump ball situations I have it all the time you get right in the middle of a jump ball and you know how it is no one ever wants to be the first guy to let go of the ball which I've never figured out. <laughs> you just jump in there and be between you and the two guys, hey, good sportsmanship guys, really appreciate it. No one ever hears but the three of you. It's little things like that that will help you be successful uh, on, on and honestly off the court. You're going to run into these people in class the next day or you, they're friends of yours or whatever it is, which is always tough. And, and they may tell you, hey, you know, I really appreciate it because that other guy was a knucklehead. And if you hadn't said that, we'd have probably gotten a fight or something or other. Another a good game management tip. Be courteous to everybody that you come in contact with at a gym. There's a referee I know. I'm not going to tell you his name. You guys wouldn't know him, but he's a high school referee and he's a good referee. He thinks the only reason people pay their six or eight bucks to go to a high school game is to watch him referee. No, no. The best referees are the one that you go, well, who was that guy? Did you see those guys? I didn't even, who were they? Perfect. They never even noticed it. It's perfect. This guy's out there. You know, he makes a call, bang, throwing it around, doing the whole deal, goes over, you know, the scorer's bench, he's like, fouls on, you know, he does the flex and the whole deal. And no, you know, fouls on 14, did this, let's go on. You don't need to be the show. No one is there. Now, Ted Valentine thinks people are watching him that pay money to watch him referee. I mean, and I, Ted, I hope you hear that. <laughs> Not one of the most liked guys in the officiating brethren. Um... Treat the coaches respectfully, but at the same time, you've got to handle them. High school in the state of Indiana right now is at an all-time low when it comes to coach-official relationships. It is awful, and you know why? Because the coaches evaluate the officials to determine where they get to go in the tournament. That's like the players that you are refereeing getting to fill out an evaluation card at the end of the game, turning them in, and going, you sucked, you sucked, you sucked, you sucked, you sucked. Because if you called fouls on them or technicals on them, what are they going to do? Bad ratings. Well, in Indiana High School, that's the way it is. I've refereed 18 million years and done all kinds of different things. And the high school tournament this year, I'm not complaining. The system is what it is. I'm the third rated guy out of six at my high school sectional. What? Come on. So the, the point is, Treat people with respect, but at the same time, you've got to take care of the coaches. Because here, here's my mantra to young kids. If you don't take care of it at this end of the floor and let that coach jump and yell and scream, guess who's seeing that and will give you a negative evaluation? The guy at the other end of the floor. And, and oh, by the way, if something goes bad for him the second half, he saw what the other guy got away with during the first half, and he's going to know that he can do all that too. And there's nothing you can do as a referee to stop him because you've let this guy go too far. Now I've got to let this guy go too far. If not, it's not a fair game. 
take care of the coaches. And, that, and maybe that's one of the reasons my evaluation isn't very good in high school is because I take care of it. I don't care anymore. I always say I'm on the downhill side of a very mediocre career. Think about that. Yet I worked more places and more games than I ever dreamed of. When I first started, it, the little kids, my goal was to work one high school JV game. That was been really cool. The next thing you know, you're off and running, and you go, well, I'd like to do a varsity game. That was, the JV game was kind of fun. And you work five years of that, and you go, well, these guys are starting to do college games. How do they get into that? You go to a couple camps, you do this, you do that. Wow, I can work college. I know what I'm doing. Well, if I'm working NAI over here at Marion, geez, I wonder how I get to go to University of Indianapolis, a Division II. Figure that out. Next thing you know, you're working at Butler. I worked a couple games over here for Thad Mata. That's how long ago it was. Uh, and, and, you know, you're working at, you know, all the Division I stuff, and it just kind of happens if you keep your nose clean. But not everybody gets there, that's for sure. If I would have never worked a college game ever, I'd have been happy. That's just fine. Because if somebody asked me the other day, Mike, you've worked hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of games over the years. What's the one game you're ever going to remember? One. Put it on your tombstone. What's the one? And I honestly think my very first high school sectional game, which was at Shelbyville, about an hour from here, against a little school called Triton Central. That was before class basketball. And Triton Central was 19 and 1. And Shelbyville was 10 and 10. Shelbyville had a not so good year. The only game that Triton had lost in the year was against Shelbyville. So I had the rematch. Two man game, which you guys work two man here. Okay. Two man game, four overtimes, and the ball, the, the shot was in the air to put it into the fifth. I will never forget that game. And the guy I worked with, Bob Klein, I can still remember running off the floor. My future wife was at the game. She's up in the stands at the end of the third overtime, and I see her, and she's just got her head buried in, in, her, in her lap because she can't work. Or she, can't, she just can't watch anymore because of all, it was just one of those kind of days. How many of you from Indiana? You guys don't understand the heyday of Indiana basketball. There was an article in, do you talk about it some? Is that why you, there was an article in, I think it was in today's Indianapolis Star about the Wigwam, which was a, a famous gym in, in Anderson. And you know, I worked there several times, and, and it, it just, it's just so different now. When I was growing up, I could tell you the top 10 high schools in the state of Indiana, their gyms, and what their, what their capacity was at each one. The Wigwam was 8,998. Newcastle was 9,325. And I wasn't the only kid on the block that could do it. That's just the way we were raised. I could tell you all 64 sectionals where they were played. We just recite them. From Argos to Washington Catholic. And that's just the way it was. It's just different now. And I'm not saying it's necessarily worse. I'm just telling you it's a lot different. Um, more game management stuff. Know who your best players are. Do you guys know these intramural games? You know these guys. You know them pretty well. And when they come on the floor, you kind of know who the best players are. Cheat for those players. And here's why. Don't cheat blatantly like, oh, well, you took seven steps. I'm not going to call travel. That's obviously travel. But if you keep those guys in the game, like if they get four fouls, or how many do you get five here? Try to keep them in the game. Because if they're in the game, it makes for a better game. Because especially at what level you're officiating, if that best player goes out and the sixth or seventh best player has to come in, it all goes to hell. It's just no good. you got people that can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Try to keep them in the game. Seriously, know your foul. It's, it's hard. I know it's hard. There's no scoreboards for you guys and all that kind of stuff. But we know, we, we have a saying, beat the tape. On that fifth foul, it better not be some little thing like this that only you and that guy saw. You, you better, the whole gym better go, yep, that was a foul. Make sure that fifth one is worth something, okay? Now, on the other side of the coin, and I had it last week. Anybody from Newcastle? Okay, good. There's a coach there. His name is Steve Bennett. And off the court, he's a really nice guy. He used to be an assistant at Evansville when Jim Cruz, the St. Louis coach, was at Evansville. That's, I've been around too, too many places and too many people. Anyway, Steve's son plays on the team. 
And the only bigger jerk on the floor than Steve is Steve's son. <laughs> okay. Well, last was it last week, I think, Anderson in Newcastle was at Anderson. And the week before, by the way, referees at our level are the biggest social... Ten minutes after you leave the gym, you're on the phone, texting, emailing. Hey, how was your game? What's your game like? How was that jerk number 40 for whatever school? Did you tech him? Did you handle this? How was the coach? I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I don't care if you're driving six hours home or ten minutes. You're on the phone and you're finding out everything that happened everywhere you went, especially if you've got those teams coming up later on because we want to know. That's We're bad that way. So anyway, Steve is, the week before he had named the three referees for his game in the newspaper by name and had told them they were out of their league, they couldn't handle it, I don't know why they were ever refereeing our games, they're never going to referee at Newcastle again. Well, guess who knew that going into his next game? And uh, the other two guys that were working with us. Not a good thing for Steve. You don't want to jack with the brethren. We're in a, kind of an unofficial union. All right. Now, we're not going to just walk on the floor and go, hey, Steve, here's one for last week in the newspaper article. Have a seat. No. But at the same time, you know, you got to know that. You got to know that. That if nothing else, he's a threat. You got to be aware that he's a threat to, to trying to do the best job you can for those 10 kids on the floor. Every one of my pregame meetings with the coaches is, guys, here's the deal. It's the three of us referees and you two coaches working together to make the game as good as we can possibly be for the 10 kids that are on the floor. I say that every single game I have when we meet with the coaches. And some of them kind of look at you like, what do you mean? And so my, but my next comment is, now it's the five of us. It's not five more guys on the bench down there and five more guys on the bench down there. It's the five of us working together. Steve didn't get that apparently. Because we have our little meeting and during the, the national anthem, actually starting lineups, and Anderson, they turn out the lights and do the spotlight and do all that. He comes over to us and goes, hey, you guys going to let, uh, let the defense beat on 21 like this on his shot all night long, like everybody's been doing all year? This is before the game starts. This is during starting lineups. Now, 21 is his son, okay? And, and I just turned to him. I said, Steve, I haven't seen you in two years. I have no idea what you're talking about. Let's just, and I just walked away. Well, let's put it this way. For the first seven minutes and 30 seconds of the game, he got to stand up and walk around and do whatever he wanted. After that, bingo. And it was on his, his son's third foul in the first quarter. Think about that. And he, he deserved every one of them. And we should have teched him because he's eyeballing this and yapping and doing this and that. So on the son's third foul, he jumps off and just yelling and banging and doing everything after he'd been warned not to do that. And I turned around so fast I almost sprained an ankle tacking him. Now, I'm not proud of that, but it had to be done. I probably have called less technical fouls over the years than almost any official has done as many games as I have because I pride myself in being able to have a good relationship with the coaches. I think it's important. But this guy had one coming, had jacked with us, and had been warned all the way out on the floor Yelling and screaming, Steve, you can't do that. You got to get back. If you got a question, I'll answer it. I'm not even talking to you. I'm talking to those two guys over there. If you're talking to them, you're talking to me, because we're we're a group. There's, we're not three individuals. We're one group. And he didn't get it. And next time down the floor, there's a foul, whatever, and he didn't like it. And so have a seat the rest of the day. So work with the coaches, but you've got to take care of it. And if you don't have the guts or the fortitude to do that, it's tough because they're going to they're gonna see that and they're going to wear you out. And I guarantee there are some people playing in these games out here that see certain ones of you coming and going, ha, ha, oh, we got no problem tonight. This guy's scared to death of me. Guarantee it. And that's not a knack or a knock on you guys. It's just kind of the way it is. In some other part of life, that person might be very scared of you because they, you intimidate them, like hopefully in the classroom. That's where, which is the most important place to intimidate anyone. As I'm raising a high school kid, I'm trying to tell him that. Um, fouls. You guys keep track, team fouls? If it gets to be 5-1 to one or 6-1, to one, call one for the team that only has one. 
find one. Don't cheat. You're managing the game. Now what you don't want to do is call a f that foul on the guy who already has one. So now he's got two and it's the only two called on the team. You can find a hand check. You can find something on a rebound. You can find a little bump. I'm not telling you that every game's going to be like that because some games one team's playing zone and the other team is just they're, they're playing a vicious man-to-man -man and they're trapping all over the court. They're going to have more fouls on them. They want to have more fouls on them because that's part of the game that they, they want to, uh, they're just trying to, they, they figure they're going to get more steals and you're not going to call as many fouls as that are out there. So that in the long run, they're going to win. They're going to wear you down and wear the other team down. So sometimes it just gets out of whack and there's nothing you can do. And you got to tell the coach, look, you guys are standing back shooting threes. You're not going to the hole. If you go to the hole, we'll call some fouls. So, but understand that the foul count and what it means to the game. How many of you have been out refereeing and gone up to a coach or a player and said, you know what, you're right, I missed that? Absolutely. You get one at each end per game. Don't do it twice. <laughs> and I would say, you guys, you have the same probably teams and players a lot. I wouldn't even do it all that often because they're going to say, well, geez, last game the guy blew one, he blew one again this game. If you only blow one a game, that's pretty good. In a college game, we figure we've got about 110 or 120 calls a game. And if there's three referees and we each get one, that's not too bad. Now, we, make, we miss calls all the time. I will miss calls tonight. I will miss calls in my get college game tomorrow. But when, when you know you blew one, and you know when it is, and the coach is, sees it, and maybe you're standing right here, and the coach is sitting right here, and you've got the same look at it, and he jumps up and says, what in the world, and you know you blew it? When you're done, you're reporting that foul, you get back over there, you get by him, you go, coach, you know what? This is my whistle. Coach, you're right, I'd like to have it back. I'll try to get better. All right, I mean, what's he gonna say? I screwed up. There's not much they can say. But just don't do it very often, that's for sure, because, you know, that, that can lead to some, some bad things. Um, this is more for high school guys, but do you guys have a coach's box? We don't. Do you even have coaches, per se? So it's captains? or yes. They do? You have coaches? Yes. Some do. Some do. Okay, and they probably come dressed like... Real coaches and some. <laughs> you should hire me for one game. <laughs> Let me bring in two of my buddies and, and just work one game. That would be good. <laughs> I've got some favorite lines I like to use with coaches, and these are not derogatory. They can be, but <laughs> they just don't know it sometimes. Um, I, I, the Michigan State Indiana game, like I said, I went to IU. I don't know how many of you have watched it, but it was an absolute classic in every sense of the word. There was so much stuff going on in that game that it was unbelievable. And how those referees handled Crean and Izzo that game, I just thought was remarkably good. Both of them should have had at least one, if not two, technicals. But the game was that big and that important. You know, Crean had Indiana won up there in 20 years. Crean worked for Izzo. There's all kinds of different stuff going on. It's, it's national TV. It's for the number one uh, spot in the Big Ten. It might be for a number one seed in the Midwest at our place. Tickets on sale, by the way. <laughs> Throw that in. Uh, who knows what it's for? And I thought these guys were masterful. And there's a guy named uh, Pat Driscoll, who's one of the referees on the game. And I could see him in a, in, they kind of showed a close-up of Crean, or of uh, Izzo. And Izzo is just screaming across the court, just just going bananas. And that's so loud, the guy across the court can't hear what he's saying, but he's yelling. So what's Driscoll do? He, gets, he runs over to him, stands like this, he's right behind me, and I see him mouth the words, Tom, talk to me. And he's just immediately diffused the whole thing. Now Izzo is not yelling across the court at whoever it was. He's in Driscoll's ear right here. And you could see him, he just immediately calms down. And he's just going, you know, this, that, whatever, but he's just talking right here. And Pat's doing this, and yep, I hear you. You can just, you can see the conversation. And that is a tremendous way to diffuse the situation. Go talk to him, listen to him. Those coaches know more about basketball than any referees have ever refereed the game. 
That's why they are, they are at the level that they are at. Guess who's the Marion coach now? Licklider. I've got them tomorrow. Licklider, I know. I can't remember if I ever had any of his games here or not. But I've known him for a long time. Well, he's in a different spot now, I'll just say, in his coaching career than he was when he was here. And he was on his, his way up. He's doing great work over there. The Marion University is, is, is they're going to go a long way. I've heard they want to go Division I eventually, and they've got the right pieces in place to do that. But he's used to a different level of officiating than what he's getting at Marion University. I mentioned to you that the, there's, we're missing a couple zeros in our paycheck. And so is he in his to be able to have the same level of game he was used to working at here or at Iowa. It's just different. So now it's kind of a different relationship. And so now you have to talk to him a little bit more often because he's frustrated. Because he's used to having bigger and better athletes. He's used to winning a lot of his games. And he's used to seeing, frankly, better officials than guys like me who are out there. So it's a different thing. You've got to spend a little bit more time with him and talk him through it. And that's just, it's just relationships and management. And I, I really think in my life, my professional life, it, it, it all kind of works together. Because our job running Lucas Oil Stadium is not, we don't have to be rocket scientists. N not, thank God. If so, I was kicked out a long time ago. But we have to be really good at relationships and managing people. There's 3,000 people that work there on game day. 3,000. I don't know all of them, but you've got to have people in place that know how to manage them. Okay? We also work with the NCAA and the NFL and you know, all the other different people. It's about developing relationships. And if you can do that on the basketball court in the hardest possible setting imaginable with all those people yelling and screaming at you, you ought to be able to do it in your regular life goes back to the, the comment about balance. This, you may not believe it, but this helps you if you're an official, if it's swimming or football or whatever it is, this helps you. And I, I also think, now when I, we're looking for people to come work for us. If I've ever done one thing right in my life, it's I've had the ability to recognize young people and realize that, that they are good and can be good in our industry. I've got people all over the country and around the world that used to work for us. They're doing different jobs now. They're running something at the NCAA. One guy's doing stuff for WWE. I mean, he's in charge of all their live broadcasts all over the world. That's kind of a big job. He was my intern years ago. So the point is, if you can do this stuff, you're also learning about time management. Which is the, if, I'm, if, you're, and if you're interested in getting into events or sports, time management is the most valuable thing you can possibly have. I'm going to get off of fishing for just a second and get on that. Because I, I talked to a group, I'm going to IU to talk to a group next week. I've talked to a group earlier this week. How, how do they, if they're in, in your guys' age, how do they try to get to that next step? And, and my comment is, you ought to be as busy now as you're ever going to be in your entire life. If they want you to work 12 games a week and you can only work six, work 12. Because I think, unless they've changed college, how many hours of class do you take? What's 15? Is that okay? So that means, if I'm not mistaken, you're actually in class about 15 hours a week. Is that rough? Is that about right? Okay, so 24 hours in a day times seven days a week, because we know college kids don't sleep. You're all out doing whatever it is you do. So you're in class 15 hours a week. And you're studying, now realistically, two, two and a half, three hours a night max, on average. Am I right? If that, if that. I mean, this is Butler. You know, it's not hard here. It's not hard here. Some, some nights you don't have, and what, you have class maybe four days a week, sometimes five? The point is, if you're not doing something else with all that downtime, if it's officiating, if it's making yourself better, somehow you're cheating yourselves. You're absolutely cheating yourselves. Took a full load, basketball manager, which by the way was before, before the 20 hour rule for athletes, we practiced all day and all night. Weekends, Christmas, it didn't matter. Now they have rules. You can't abuse the kids like you used to. And then what I do, I went and refereed intramurals. 
So, you know, I'd have class, normal class schedule, go out to assembly hall about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Practice was at 3.30. We'd get done at 6, 6.30. And then I'd run in the intramural fields till 9.30, 10 o'clock, and then still somehow manage to graduate. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it was on a roll or anything like that, but I got in and got out. And I, to this day, the stuff I did away from academics is more important than what I did in in the classroom. Some jobs are like that, some fields are like that, some are not. But if you're not out there doing, making yourself that much busier than the next guy and learning all about that kind of stuff and how to manage your time, you're cheating yourselves. Because here, this just in, you are his competition. You guys, because at the end of the year or when you guys graduate and you're in the same field, what have you done to make you better than him? And that's the facts. And when I'm looking at a resume, I've got two or three in today I was looking at, I'm going, okay, I went to Butler, that's great. I took 15 hours of this, or here's my degree, great, so did everybody else. Um, I had a 3.6, great, so did everybody else. Um, I refereed Aaron Murrells, oh, okay. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Uh, I had an internship with so-and-so, all right. I paid my own way through school, which is hard to do these days, uh, that okay. Um, I was the president of my fraternity something. I, I'm looking for stuff that is not just, well, I went to Butler and graduated. Nah, big deal. So did everybody else. Something different. And this is one of the ways officiating and being involved with intramurals is, is one way that, that you can do that. You can set yourself apart from the average guy. Okay, I'll get off the soapbox. Does anyone have questions? Anything at all? Yes, sir. What was Bob Knight like? What was Bob Knight like in practice? How did he wear you down this week? Like, what would he say? Uh, I can't say it. I'm on the <laughs> mic. <laughs> um, here, here's the deal. In practice, Coach Knight was really tough, but he's also very smart. Back then, we used to have travel partners. So if you would go to Michigan on Thursday, you were at Michigan State on Saturday instead of all haphazard like it is now. It was more, the travel's easier, it was economical. And they also used to go, you'd play teams one through nine. That's actually when the Big Ten was ten teams. And you'd play teams one through nine, and then you'd flip the schedule and play nine through one. So we used to play Ohio State the first game of the year and then the last game of the year, okay? So in the middle... Well, one year we played Northwestern, number nine, and then a week later, we killed them up at their place, and a week later, they're coming to our place. They got no chance. We're on our way to winning a national championship as a freshman. We're, there, we're not gonna lose Northwestern at home after we beat them by 20 up there. Well, what does coach do? He throws these guys out of practice on Monday, two days after we beat Northwestern up there. Threw them out of practice, mad as hell. Why do you do it? Get their attention. He also gets them off the floor, gets them off their feet. Gives them more time to study. Shorter practice, more study time. And it took, as a freshman, you don't realize it, but guys like Ted Kitzel and Randy Whitman who'd been around there for a while, they're going, don't worry about it. We know what's going on, we get it. Guys, you all better be at study table tonight because that's the reason he kicked us out of here to get our attention and to give us more time to get off our feet and to study. So you better go do that. So he was a master at those kinds of things, smarter than anybody. Now he also had some sides of him that, you know, honestly weren't that pleasant. But I also live by a, a code that all of us have been through there have said what, what happened in Assembly Hall stays in Assembly Hall. So unless it's the group of the brethren of uh, those former guys, we don't talk all that much about it because it's just some things are, and good and bad. Good and bad. He, I will tell you this, he, every year, I think his birthday was in uh, middle of October, or is in the middle of October, he'd kick him out every year on his birthday. <laughs> because he knew, well, one of the jobs of the managers, we had to go out and get a cake and put, you know, happy birthday, coach night, whatever, and the players used to have to roll that cake across the floor over to the coach, coach's locker room. And they, he had just kicked them out of practice. And he knew it, and he knew the cake was coming. And you got all the candles on there. So the guys that all have to get in the locker room after just getting kicked out, happy birthday to you. I mean, it was just hilarious. And he knew what he was doing. So, you know, anyway. Yes, sir? Um, those indirect, like, subtle things that Coach and I used, and then you talked about the one that um, the one that we used with the back pocket. 
Well, um, any any conversation you can have with a coach or a player that it's just you two. I've dropped down and tied my shoe when I see a guy maybe tying his shoe or some guy I'm having a problem with. The best time to do it is when they're lining up for free throws because everybody's watching that referee that's going over there to call the foul, report the foul, and I've got six or eight guys standing around here and that's a great time to communicate. Hey guys, watch your hooking in the paint. You know, look, that guy just got called for foul. We're looking for it. Be, be ready. Those kinds of things. One of my favorite ones is if we got a tight game, excuse me, and you know there's fouls mounting up, I get the ball, one shot, bounce it to the guy, and go, all right, don't waste one on a free throw, guys. Don't waste one here. No one see, he sees or hears it, but those six or eight guys that are standing right there. The fans don't hear it. The coaches don't see it. You know, you're kind of looking down. Don't waste one here. And there's, there, I mean, there's all kinds of things. And you have to have your own personality. Like, I worked a, a million Hanover and Franklin games and know the coaches very well. And so you'd run down at one end and the coach is in your ear. And you run down the other end and, and the coach goes, what's he saying to you? Well, he wanted to know where we want to go out to eat, eat tonight. You have any suggestions? Yeah, okay, you guys should try this place. Okay, go down the other end. Well, what's he saying to you? He recommends so-and-so to go out to eat. Go out to eat. I don't want to go out to eat with you. I know, but he thinks that you do. So, you know, you just have some fun with them. And in, in, in a NCAA Division Three around here, which I used to work the hell out of, um, you might have a coach five times in a year for seven or eight straight years. It's a friendship. And you've got to take care of business, but at the same time, it's a friendship. And you have to be able to get along. Now, somehow... Like tomorrow, I've got Marion and Bethel at Bethel. Excuse me, my voice apparently is changing. I had that game last Saturday at Marion. Marion was up 13 points with 3 minutes and 52 seconds to go and lost. And it changed the seeding in the tournament. They were up 6 with less than a minute to go and missed 3 front end of 1-1s. Good news is... The referees can't blow that big of a lead. That was not us. We're putting you at the line. Don't blame us. So now this Saturday, I've got the rematch in the tournament up there at Bethel. Should be a lot of fun. Should be interesting. But don't think that the three referees, uh, Brad Klaus, David Gentili, and I, haven't talked about what happened last week. We've got to be aware. We've got to be aware of what's going on. Who are the big guys? Who are the jerks? Who are the good players? Who can we go to in a pinch and go, hey, 14 really help us out. Your, your guy's, your guy's kind of starting to be a jerk. We want to keep him in the game. Those kinds of things. It's just relationships. And the guys that have those relationships last a long time. Somehow or another, I'm still around. I'm still around. Any other questions? Those are good ones. Yes, sir. Um, you talk a little bit about in-game game management, close game, last minute or whatever. Teams are it's within you know one or two possessions. You know fouls are coming. You know timeouts are coming. That kind of situation. It's one thing we've seen here is um, we're ha we're handling games well um, until it gets to that point, and then we're kind of not ready for certain situations that are happening. Well, here's what I do. There's a timeout. I the kids come out of the timeout, and I go to the captain or if somebody I know, I go, "What are you going to do? What do you mean? What am I going to do? Are you going to foul? Are you going to call a timeout after a made basket? Are you going to go for a steal? What are you doing?" I want to know. I'm not telling the other team. I would never tell the other team. But the last thing I want, stand up here, is I'm trying to foul and I give one of these and we don't call it. So this, then it's not one of these, it's one of these, and then it's that because you haven't called it. Preventive, preventive officiating, trying to get out in front of it. Hey coach, you going to call a timeout on a make here? Meaning if they hit one and they're going to call a timeout, yeah, 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 I am. I said, great, just make sure you stand up and let the whole world see, and I'll get it for you. That's good stuff. They appreciate that. And especially if you've had a hard time with that coach during the game. Now he knows you're not trying to screw him. And we all know, we don't care who wins these games. We're just trying to get there, keep peace, get in the car, hopefully get home in one, one piece, and work the game the next day. That's all we're trying to do. And that's, I mean, there's several of those kinds of things. But if you can find out what's going on before it happens, somehow, some way, that's a good thing. 
and a lot of times you can't, especially as the course of the game goes on. But at the end of the game, if you if you're ahead of it, then you're going to be you're going to be better off. And the coaches, I mean, I'll tell them again in my in my pregame. The five of us we're all working together. Hey, we may come to you if it's a close game at the end and go, what are you doing? Let me know, because I don't want somebody to get hurt. And most of them kind of okay, yeah, I get it. That makes sense. <coughs> so, any other questions? That's good. Yes, sir. How do you handle? Say there's like 10 seconds on the clock, the, uh, the team with the ball is down by two. How do you handle like when they drive to the lane, do you let more contact go? No. Or? No. I don't. I mean, different guys are different things. There's a couple of words or phrases in officiating, and this isn't at your level, honestly, even mine. Although our games are on some kind of internet something. Um, if, 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 call the obvious, okay? Some absolutes, okay. So if a guy goes up and and you know bumps into a guy, I mean you got to have it. But it, at the same time, I, I, a foul in the first five minutes of the game is a foul in the last five minutes of the game. Now I, their exceptions are if it's away from the ball and has nothing to do with the play. You know the shorter punching some guy over here in the corner, you're not going to do that because you're going to catch all kinds of hell. Just let it go ahead. And the guy's driving to the hoop, and this guy over here grabs somebody like that. Eh, let it go. Let it go. Um, but generally speaking, you no, know, it's it's the same because if not, you're really you're cheating the team because it, maybe they've gone to the hole that same way all game, and that's the play they set up and design, and now all of a sudden you change the rules on, them. and that's not that's not right. At least I don't think. Big time guys may think differently. Can you talk about some of the calls that, that you personally find are the hardest ones to make? Calls, calls that you have the hardest time. Well, the block charge is still the hardest, and to a certain extent, you're guessing. Uh, I'm assuming your teachers here have told you to referee the defense, so you use that. Okay, that's if you can master that, which is hard to do. Um, it's just hard to take your eye off the guy with the ball, but the odds are they're not going to hurt you. Okay, maybe they might travel, maybe they might palm it, but you know, in our day and age, we're not calling a lot of that anyway, the hairline stuff. Um, but I, I don't like that one. I also don't like when they're, when they're driving to the hole and they're side by side and, you know, and then somebody goes up, who's causing the contact? That's hard for me. Now they have to originally establish legal guarding position, which most defenders don't. Um, so it's the easy thing is to to call the one where you know the it's always on the defense, but you don't know if there's push offs and things like that. But a lot of it you can get around it by getting yourself in a good position. Straight line, do you guys you hear the term straight line? Maybe maybe they haven't. Straight line is where you don't want to be. So that would be me here, a guy with the ball there, and his defender there. I can't see anything. I want to be able to look between them, so I want to get out here and look right here so now I can see something. And especially on rebounds and things like that. You can't, can I do this, is that all right? I'll do, I'm not very good at this, but three point shot, oh boy, <laughs> told you, I'm left handed. But if there's, if I'm, if I'm the center here, I'm doing three man here and the trail is over here that's the bench if I'm here and there's two guys going for a rebound here and they're like this I can see through that okay but take me down here I, I can't see through that did this guy push this guy I don't know I have no idea I can't tell because I can't see what's going on in here we also have plays where if there's a play right in here and this guy's too close, or this guy's actually looking under here. This guy's maybe too far away, or he gets guys in front of him. You'll see this guy come through and make the call. Why? Because he's got a perfect angle. And he can see, you know, the whole C's part, and he can look right through there, and bang. Now, you want to give these two guys a shot at it, but then if you if oh, they didn't get it, you step in there and get it. And that's the mark, like in college, even in high schools to a certain extent, we all know each other. We're all independent contractors and, and you don't necessarily know who you're working with from one game to the next, but we've all been through, through the same training. 
We've all, we all know what's going on. And we can walk on a floor, one guy from the East Coast, one guy from the Midwest, one guy from the West Coast, and we're going to be just fine because we've all had the same training. And you guys have had the same training too, obviously a little, a little different, but that's one of, the, uh, one of the ideas that all the training that we go through uh, or why we do it. Any other questions? Yes. Um, kind of twofold question. I know you mentioned kind of talking with other referees and you know how games went. Yep. Going game to game before a game, do you necessarily talk to your referees and say, "Hey, we're looking for this specific thing." Going to game game, looking for you know push underneath. Absolutely. Push outside for moving. From yep. Pre-game conference. Absolutely. And you can do it. You know, you can text or email guys a couple days ahead of time. But we work often enough that. Uh, like, I'm not going to call the guys tonight for tomorrow's game. We get there 90 minutes before the game starts. We have to be on the floor 30 minutes before the game starts for a college game. We've got plenty of time to go in and go through our stuff as we're getting dressed or doing whatever. And again, by this time of the year, we know both of these teams. We know the coaches. We know the players. Like, you know, tomorrow we get, okay, captains. Well, we know who the captains are. Okay, five, you're the captain. You know, 22, you're the captain because we just know these guys. So, uh, but that's the time to do that. And the other thing is we get video pipelines, updates from the NCAA, might be 10 times during the year. And you can watch all the video and there'll be a bunch of plays on there. And, and the whole country, every referee that's signed up to be an NCAA referee gets this stuff. So we're all watching it. It's film, it's game film is what it is. And they say, okay, here were some unusual plays. And these are games you've seen on TV. This isn't, you know, no offense, Marion and Bethel. These are big time games that have been on ESPN. And they'll go, okay, did they make this call right? And there's three referees on there. You'll know all three of them. They're all big timers. And you go, did they get this right? Well, then they'll slow it down and set it up. Well, the guy was in good defensive position. He didn't move. Uh, you know, the defender went into him, clearly a charge. Uh, so there's, I guess you would call it continuing education. Um, is That's really what it's come to. When I first started, we didn't even have cell phones. You know, you'd call guys from home two or three days ahead of time. Hey, you're going to be there? Yeah, I'll be there. And that was it. And now, it's, you know, as you guys know, it's constant. And apparently some guys keeping track of all our calls. Or whatever. What the hell is that? Really? My God, that's crazy. All right, anything else? Any other questions? Yes? How do you handle when, like, a player asks you about a call that your partner made? Um, truthfully, as best you can. And a lot of times... You know, partner, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I was looking over here. I can't help you, which is really the truth a lot of times. Or if there were two whistles on it, like two guys had it, I would say, well, I'll tell you what, he may have missed it, but the other guy didn't. There were two whistles. So I think they got it right. Pretty sure they got it right. Okay, all right. Uh, but if, I mean, if you just blew it, and or the other guy blew it, and he knows he blew it, and the whole gym knows he blew it, and you just say something, the co or the guy comes up to you and goes, look, we know, just, we got it, but you're right, he missed it. Just be honest, just be honest with you. Now, if he's going to go running, hey, coach, he said he missed it, you know, then you're kind of in trouble, but that's not good, but hopefully you can gain the respect of the players where that won't happen. This is, it's communication. It's no different than you guys are doing with your girlfriends or boyfriends or your teachers or whatever else. It, it's communication. And the more you communicate and the more professionally you communicate, the better off you're going to be. We can't text each other out on the floor. We actually have to talk. It's a little different. A little different. Anything else? One more question maybe or not? Not? That's okay. All right. What do you see uh, young officials struggle the most with and how would you advise them in order to well, I think the guys now, are, uh, uh, I'll answer it two ways. I think guys now are trying to get on TV like really fast. A and here's a fact. I think there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 315 Division I teams, something like that. Is that right? Okay, okay. And if they're all playing each other on the same day, we'll call it 320 because it's easier to divide. That's 160 games. No, is that right? Yeah, 160 games times three referees, which is 480 guys. That's all they need. In the Indiana Officials Association, which is a high school association that I belong to, 
there's 200 guys in that association and there are two associations in Indianapolis. There are thousands of basketball referees. There's all of you guys. And to try, they're trying to get there too fast. And the reality of it is the faster you get there, a lot of times the faster you fall because you can't handle it. You haven't had the experience. So my point is pay your dues. I was 34, 35 when I worked my first Division I game, which was kind of average back then because they're not going to hire a 50-year-old guy now. They're going to hire a 30-year-old guy, and they should. I get that. But now you see guys that are 26, 27, 25 sneaking into some Division I games. There might actually be a guys on the floor that are as old as they are if they're working graduate school or doing whatever. It's like, whoa. They just haven't had enough life experiences to handle going out there in front of, if it's 8,000 or 11 or 15 or 20,000 people, they just haven't had enough. So take your time. Take your time. If you get to be a Division I referee at age 40 and you're in any kind of condition at all, you've still got a good 15 years to work. That's a lot. That's a lot. The, the other thing is, you got to work at it. You got to study it. If you really want to be good at it, know the rules. I am horrible at the rules. Horrible. If I don't understand it, I don't call it. I couldn't tell you what a false multiple foul is to save my life, but it's in the rule book. I just don't call it. Or if it happens, I call it something else. I mean, just, but it comes down to common sense. And again, I'm not the best referee in the world. I never was. It's, at one point in time, I was pretty good. But I'm on the downhill side. And the difference between guys that are going here and guys that are here, a lot of times are their knowledge of the rules. Their knowledge of the rules. So I would say, I used to watch a lot of video. I used to watch, or I was in the rule book every day, at least looking up something. I'd seen a play or somebody told me about a play. And then I was communicating with other referees and, you know, what you'd see, what you, well, I just don't have the time to do that anymore. But those guys, if they have that kind of time, then they're the ones that are going to make it. My, my, when I knew it was time for me to get out, I got out about four years ago for two years for family and work reasons. And it got to the point where when I was packing that bag in the morning, I had to go referee. I had to go to Quincy, Illinois tonight, a four-hour drive or whatever it was, five-hour drive, lose an hour coming home. You're getting, up at, getting home at 3, and I got a meeting at 7.30. I had to referee. It wasn't I get to referee anymore. I had to referee, and that's when I knew... This ain't doing right. So I got out for a couple of years and things calmed down and I realized my marriage wasn't built for me to be home six days a week. So now I'm back and my wife was happy. It's all good. We're out of time. Anything else? Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Go, go dogs. Go dog. Here's my dream, dream game. Lucas Oil Stadium, Sunday afternoon, I think it's March, is it April 1st, whatever, 31st and the 1st, whatever that Sunday is, IU plays Butler to see the winner goes to the Final Four. That could happen. That could happen. <laughs> yes, it would. Uh, and so would my cash register. <laughs> we got you one of our, our prize champ shirts. Very good. Hopefully Thank you. Appreciate that very much. And then we also got you a little... Get thank you. Well, so. You guys are very kind. Thank you again for coming and, and speaking to our group. And uh, we would love to have you back for the championship game to appreciate. <laughs> uh, let me check my schedule. <laughs> I'll get back to you.